prior to the mural project, this walkway was all beige. Wonderfully beige. You can see remnants of the beige over there. The entire thing always gave me prison vibes. But in a way, like it, the beige contributed to that. <laughs> it made this not a space where you could picture anything good happening, I guess. Welcome to Minnesota Historia. I'm Haley, your host to history, and this is the Chief Buffalo Memorial Project. I really felt like this space could promote being able to have a broader perspective and understanding and picture of the history that we all share here. This is Mary Villiard, a visual artist in Duluth, Minnesota. She collaborated with Chief Buffalo's eldest descendants and many other artists to make this project happen. The Zeitgeist Center for Art, they reached out to the Indigenous Commission. Indigenous Commission submitted a list of topics. I don't remember what the other topics were because it was just like, Chief Buffalo, I'm doing this. You see Mary's work all over Duluth. She often uses art to uplift underrepresented narratives. And Chief Buffalo's narrative is seriously underrepresented. You know, I'd heard the name Chief Buffalo kind of tossed around and I knew we were on ceded territory, but I wasn't sure what any of that really meant. I feel like a, most people don't know, <laughs> you know. I didn't know. And Chief Buffalo's story is the origin story of downtown Duluth. But good luck finding him on any of the historical markers in the city or its public art until now, obviously. Yeah, Chief Buffalo, um, let's backtrack, how do we start it? Chief Buffalo was born on Madeline Island around the year 1759. 1759, that's before the Revolutionary War. At the time, Madeline Island was supposedly a part of New France. New France. Of course, we have to acknowledge this was all Ojibwe land. That's why the United States had to make so many treaties. This wall is st still in progress. It's a, a map of the different treaty territories. Anywhere you go in the United States, it's like there's some sort of treaty that is the law of the land that allows it to exist. Treaties don't give rights to native people. It's actually the opposite. It's the tribes giving rights to settlers, basically, to exist like in the same space as them. Chief Buffalo led the Lake Superior Ojibwe for nearly half a century, signing a series of treaties with the United States between 1825 and 1847. Minnesota Territory was established on March 3, 1849, and Minnesota became a state May 11, 1858. In between those two dates, you will not be shocked to learn that a lot of nefarious happened. So Minnesota is still a territory. They've got written into law plans to remove Ojibwe people from Minnesota because they're like, look at all this land, like, this is going to be ours. They come up with this scheme and it's like, it's documented, like they intentionally moved the point at which Ojibwe people could get their allotments, which were like, you know, food rations and things like that, because obviously they're like blocking Native people from accessing the land and using it themselves. So they need allotments and rations for food. They moved that point up to Sandy Lake. Sandy Lake is not close to Madeline Island or Lake Superior. It's not close to anything. Look, I'm sorry if you live there now, but at the time, its remoteness was the whole point of it. It's hard to picture when you're talking about it, like, oh, they had to go for a walk to this place. Well, it was months of walking, you know? And so people went on this journey, they get there, and the food was intentionally, like, poisoned. It was literally rotten food and so people died from that and then they had to make the journey back and over 300 people end up dying on this journey. It was called the Sandy Lake Tragedy or the Ojibwe Trail of Tears, killing people off like slowly. All intentionally orchestrated by the Governor Ramsey, who a lot of our places are named after. And so Chief Buffalo saw this, he's about 90 something years old. He decides he wants to do something about it and gets the support from all the different tribal communities in the region. Um, to make this trip to Washington, D.C. to tell the president, this just happened, our people are being killed here and we don't want to be moved anymore. That pictograph that's right there was the pictograph that he carried on his journey to Washington, D.C. Symbolically, it's basically a representation of all the different tribal leaders kind of like signing off. So their hearts and minds connecting to the crane. A lot of people think that the crane represented Chief Buffalo. He's actually Loon Clan. You see the strand that's coming out of the, the eyes, basically, the vision of the, the crane connects to whoever is holding the pictograph. And so Chief Buffalo is the one that is holding the pictograph. And so the art is like this moving piece that like whoever holds it is the voice of all of 
the folks there. So along the way, people hear about this elderly man going on this quest. And so people are like expressing their support and word gets to the president and the president meets with him. And in that meeting, we get the Treaty of 1854, which establishes a lot of the, the tribal reservations that we have in our region across Minnesota. The Treaty of 1854 guaranteed that Ojibwe people would not be moved west at a later date. They also retain their rights to hunt, fish, and participate in traditional activities. Of course, Minnesota ignored that part of the treaty until they were sued. Then on the red, you see um, the different reservations, essentially. Please note that downtown Duluth is not in red on this map. In 1854, Chief Buffalo was given his choice of land in northeastern Minnesota. I think Point of Rock was the, the point at which it was kind of like, look out from here and from this spot to this spot. And what now is Duluth, the president was like, here, here's this plot of land and you can use it, you know, for whatever, kind of whatever you want. It's Chief Buffalo's reservation. He ended up, I think, giving that plot of land to his son-in-law, Benjamin Armstrong. And then from there, it's kind of like, what happened? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it gets murky. According to the Duluth Herald, someone sprinkled an unidentified powder into Armstrong's eyes while he was asleep. He went blind. Seeking money for medical treatment, he sold off his land to several traders. At least one of them never even paid him. There's a lot of different stories about you know, what went on, but essentially we're in Duluth now. <laughs> Which brings us to 2018, when the Duluth City Council renamed Lake Place Park, a forgettable string of nouns, to Gichiodea King, which means a grand heart place. And so that was another initiative by the Indigenous Commission that took almost a decade to get through to the city that this would be renamed. The Chief Buffalo Memorial Project began the following year on a beige walkway that connects Gichiodea King to the Lake Walk. I, I think once the naming of Gichiogdea King happened, things started like setting into motion in ways that people maybe didn't expect, which is the significance of an action like that. Something as simple as changing a place name suddenly piques people's interest enough to support a project that moves the park a little bit further down or, or that recognition further down. Did you do this? This feels like maybe a rice field. Yeah, it is. So ricing, we got a powwow, a sugar bush on the side. Yeah. I didn't do all of them. I have help. So community helped paint this one. We've got two artists from North Dakota who came up and did this. Oh, yeah. So when I do mural projects, we spend a lot of time as like tour guides telling people what is the significance of this project and answering questions. So we have the Thunderbird, a water panther. And so they're like Ojibwe sort of mermaids. We did this community painting session. We got the loon for Chief Buffalo. This is Herb Fine Day and his son, um, Rising. This is a youth at a powwow. Jonathan Thunder and Tashia Hart. I wanted it to be immersive and I wanted it to not just talk about like Chief Buffalo, but like there's pieces that are like people who are alive here today. I think it's Arnie Vineo and Jim Northrup at a sugar bush, but it's just their feet. So, <laughs> and then secretly kind of back, back here, this is Chief Buffalo smoking his pipe. The Buffalo family also really wanted Chief Buffalo to be remembered in this space and um, to see something about his story here because he does have that kind of Duluth connection. So yeah, that's why Chief Buffalo's murals are here. Other episodes of Minnesota Historia include Duluth's doomed Winter Olympics, Superior Shipwrecks, The Legend of St. Erho, Hunting for Ancient Agates, and The Root Beer Lady. If you like this video, hit the subscribe button so you won't miss future episodes. If you really like this video, become a member of WDSE and support projects just like this.